on stage Mr. Rahul Mehrotra and a quick introduction about Mr. Rahul Mehrotra. Uh, Rahul is a professor of urban design and planning and the John T. Dunlop Professor in Housing and Urbanization at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University. He's also the founder principal at RMA Architects and has designed and executed projects for government and private institutions and has designed corporate workplaces, private homes, and unsolicited projects driven by the firm's commitment to the advocacy of the city of Mumbai. His most recent books, which I'm sure you're already aware of, include Working in Mumbai, a reflection of his practice, evolved through its association with Mumbai, and The Kinetic City and other essays. His writings over the last 30 years on his long-term engagement with an analysis of urbanism in India. By the way, Rahul very graciously also contributed uh, to the Understanding Conscious Living in India report. Uh, he was very gracious to share his expert inputs. Uh, we did a uh, very detailed uh, conversation with Rahul and Nairika Holkar. So thank you, Rahul. The stage is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can we have these lights off, please? Thank you very much, and thank you to the Godrej family, the curators, for this wonderful invitation. Really thrilled to be here, and very excited about the theme, Conscious Collective, because that sort of evokes a whole lot of thinking that I think we seriously need to do. And I'm going to speak uh, as an architect and try to identify and observe from within the profession what I see as the potential and maybe the issues, yeah? And so I look forward to, I think, the critical discussions over the next few days. Uh, I hope they propel us towards an ecological thinking, which is what we need, which is what I think the theme here is trying uh, to provoke, the notion of interconnectedness, whether it's forms of dwelling, the nature of our settlements, or even opportunities of livelihoods and cultural production. The sense of interconnectedness is what I, what resonates very deeply with me when I look at the theme. And I'm going to try today to make a bridge between maybe academic thinking, research, and how that might affect practice, and how in the process one forms collectives, and how that has actually propelled my own thinking. So bear with me. I will use the first half to speak about my interests that have informed my work, and in the second half, I will indulge myself with showing you six or seven projects, uh, hoping that you can see uh, some interconnections. You know, yesterday, sustainability was discussed, and I want to address that elephant in the room right away. What has happened is sustainability has now become, in my view, an unproductive category because what, it's, what has happened is it's become a mechanical and chemical fix to a problem we create. So we create the dumbest box and then we fix it chemically and mechanically. And there's a whole green industry that is evolving around it. And we've got to really be careful about that because standards, as Mr. Godred said yesterday, is critical. And what are the standards we set for ourselves will answer those problems. So, you know, for example, and I'll show you projects where we have achieved a green building by not air conditioning 100% of the building, figuring out you only need to air condition 30% of the building. Now that's an approach through design. And so we've got to now begin to think more innovatively like that. We have to think about buildings as social condensers because the human metrics gets left out of any consideration of green buildings, for example. And so how does one actually address these more complex problems is what interests me. Even simple principles such as just cross ventilation, which we seem uh, to have forgotten. And so I've called this flux architecture in a time of flux because I think we are living through uh, particularly transitional times. Uh, and yet architecture has not been sufficiently responsive to these processes of change that ranges from the shifts in ecological balances on the planet in the form of climate change, of lifestyle changes triggered off by a whole century of technical revolutions. Uh, architecture actually reinforces stability by default, uh, a fixity in time and space, and mostly by default, it actually interrupts anticipating change and changing conditions without translating the energies of these transitions into concepts and forms. And I think this is a very big issue, I think, for the future. So I think to to shift to this transitionary thinking would mean recognizing the interconnectedness. And that's why, again, this theme really resonates, as well as the unpredictability of social, economic, political, and natural systems 
to really address the problem as architects at all levels of the sp spatial temporal scale. Uh, and I think that would be what would make life on this planet much more sustainable. And I'll try to run through some of these sorts of questions to see how we might begin to address this. So flux is something we really need to address. And when flux lands on the ground, that's what happens. That's what you see. All the unreconcilable forms, conflicts, infrastructure, natural systems, this is the result of flux. And if we don't recognize it at that spatio-temporal level, at many levels simultaneously, we are not even going to come close to solving the problem. Let's just look at settlements. Charles Courier always said that the railways were the real planners of the city of Mumbai, and that was true. So a settlement, there are four sacred tenets of a settlement. Dwelling, which we call housing. Livelihoods, which is jobs. Mobility, which is how you get from where you live to your job. And amenities, which makes life better, right? Now, the shop house was the ideal paradigm because your mobility was one flight of stairs. You went from your place of living down to work. As mobility systems and cities became bigger, mobility became very elastic. And the most efficient cities are where that mobility is cross-subsidized so people can make that relationship between home and where they work. That's wonderful about these townships, right? They address all these four issues. People can cycle to work, people work, live, they have amenities, right? How does one ramp this up into larger thinking? And what's happened is because we don't look at these, this, these holy tenants, our cities have become retrospective in terms of planning. In my view, New Bombay, for Bombay, was the last avant-garde gesture where it was speculative. They were thinking about what would happen in 30 years. Now we are merely reacting to problems. So our mobility is following the problem. The mobility is not establishing new paradigms. These are fundamental aspects that you have to look at at different scales. This is a diagram a very good friend of mine, John Busquets, has made. He, he talks about what cities are about. So cities are about urbanization. A king decides you want to make a settlement. A government decides they're going to open up land. Then you divide the plots or the land so people can occupy it. And then you have buildings. In traditional cities, a monarch established urbanization, plot division, people built over time. Garden city developments in the Industrial Revolution was where urbanization and plot division happened, which means people developed estates and sold plots to people to build their own houses. In housing estates, like what we see here around us in Vikroli, urbanization, plot division, and building collapse into one, and it's a turnkey operation. Our cities are about building first, then we think about plot division to rationalize plots and give people ownership, and then we talk about urbanizing, which means we bring infrastructure and we legitimize what that city is about. Now, I don't think any one of these are a solution, but we have to give each one of them equal importance. This is the simultaneity of addressing these issues together is what will solve our problems. And you'll get pluralistic cities in the process because they are all legitimate. So these are principles that we tend to forget. But I believe, for us as architects, unless we are aware of this, it doesn't inform how we make decisions about material investments, about form, about density, et cetera. Look at Mumbai. I mean, by 2050, it's going to be back to seven islands, right? This is actually an incredible opportunity we've been completely blank to, because this becomes an opportunity actually to reimagine the metropolitan region. We should not be worrying. And what we are doing is the reverse. We are densifying all the areas that are going to be submerged. What, this is an opportunity to revisit the principles of the ideas of New Bombay, metropolitan imaginations. Those are on higher land. It's managed retreat in the jargon of planning. It could completely alter our future and how we make the transition to that is the design problem. It cannot happen overnight. It, this has got a temporal scale to it, which we are not recognizing. And it would mean different kinds of imaginations where the relationship between nature, and that's what's wonderful about these mangroves, and built form will be completely different. We will not be imagining built form and putting nature in the interstitial spaces. Rather, we will be imagining the patterns of nature and putting built form in the interstitial spaces. It's the complete reversal of how we would imagine how cities would grow. And this is that consciousness that we need to bring. It's awareness at many levels, all the way from the spiritual, I would say, to the pragmatic. Then there's the question of, you know, the global north and south, developing countries, all this jargon we throw around, but we never address 
what might be the form equivalence for each of those categories. All the categories are also, for example, third world. Third world was the third alternative to the first and second world, and we had to look for paradigms for the third world in terms of form. We are blindly copying the paradigms of other countries in the West, the global North, South. Shahid Alam had a wonderful definition. He called it the majority world, what is the global south. That's where the majority of the world's population live. Why is that part of the world? In that circle, more people live in that circle than outside that circle. It's mind-blowing. It's over three and a half billion people. The next zone is around Cairo and the Middle East, where it's 2.9 billion people. Yet we are following the paradigms of a part of the world which has completely different notions of suburbia, the suburbs. Why are we even paying attention to that? It has no relevance for us given our densities in terms of the relationship between landmass and the volume of people who live there. So these paradigms have to really be looked at. What's most important is scale. We have to simultaneously work at all these scales. You can look at the house scale, the neighborhood, urban, national, global, planetary, right? You can organize it in a different way. Now, I think the important idea here is, and I, I bring all this up because our research is informed by this, and I make a plea that we have to, as designers and architects, look at these ideas, which is that these are nestled scales, which means we have to imagine these scales nestling into each other. If you don't nestle the small into the medium, the small is isolated. And not the medium from the large, the medium is isolated. And so then we land up in gated communities, we land up in other kinds of forms, because we don't make the correlationship between the continuity. Of course, this should be a state subject. This is what planning is about. But because we've forgotten what planning is about, I think we have to remind ourselves, even in our own thinking as architects, you might be working working at the smallest scale, but I believe it's contingent on us as architects to imagine, speculate what might be the other scales which we will, we will have implications on just through our interventions. So the notion for design, and designers, all, all forms of design have to look at this notion of nestle scale. The most important point, and then I'll show you some research and projects, is the notion of the context. Context matters. It absolutely matters. And as architects, we look at context in simplistic way. We look at, you know, material. We look at climate, orientation. Uh, you know, some of us are more ambitious. We look at the culture. Some of us are even more ambitious, and we excavate the site to see embedded histories and be sensitive to that. But actually, what we have to ask ourselves is, what is the context of that context? Because nestling our understanding in the con of the context in the broader context, and the broader context is political, it's social. What are the implications of neoliberalism? What are the implications of political ideologies? How does that begin to intersect with what we are thinking of the tangible and partly intangible context? This intersection is incredible, and we have to develop the narratives to be able to understand that. And you know, one such fact family of narratives that fundamentally challenges our form of engagement as designers is that of the contemporary rapid geoeconomic integration and from that resulting uneven spatial development. And so I believe inequity, which we are seeing everywhere, will be the biggest issue we'll face in the next decades. And what does that mean for designers? And I think you, know, you don't even need to look further than the shifting demographies within our own nation, the inequality that pre it presents. And from that, of course, comes the question of political identities, the urbanization of poverty, the claims to citizenship. There are many complex problems. And it is at this point where you take the context that we understand as architects and nestle it in its context, the context of the context, at those intersections are the moments of intervention, which are the most, the most fr uh, fruitful for us to look at, because that's where you begin to find the solutions, so, so to speak. And it also helps us understand transitions. So every society is continuously in transition. But the issue is the transitions are never neat. Uh, if you go from a socialist system like we did in India to capitalism, that took three decades. And it's yet going on. It's not complete. Some parts of our thinking are very socialist, even within the government. Some parts are ultra hyper capitalist. So you are transitioning out of one system into another system. And that creates the muddle that you see in the built environment that it's not even. right. So we have to understand that as architects and as planners. So then uh, I go to this idea, uh, which for me is the most important one, 
which is the notion of our spheres of concern and our spheres of influence. Our spheres of concern are growing exponentially. We wax eloquently on poverty, on climate change, social justice. I mean, look, everyone and his uncle has an opinion on everything happening around it. But our sphere of influence is diminishing every day. It's so minuscule that that's what I see as the root of cynicism, for example, within our profession. Because, you know, I, to say it, partly in jest, is you spend an evening with buddies, young architects discuss, discussing equity, this, that, and the other. You get up in the morning and sit on your desk and you're doing an extension to your aunt's kitchen in some apartment, right? There's a huge difference between where your spheres of concern are and what your sphere of influence is. So how does one create the bridge? Pedagogy and education has a big part to play, but I think this can also be self-initiated within the profession to make this bridge, and within citizens too, it's not just the profession. Because if this disparity of our spheres of concern and influence actually broaden, we have no, MBA, we have no agency at all in transforming the built environment or otherwise, or even our lives as a society. And so for me, my proposition is that the modes of engagement become a critical question. So the modes of engagement involve research, theory, pedagogy, practice, and advocacy. In my reading, in my experience, I don't see these. What has happened in our profession is some people only do research, some people theorize. Some, I, I believe we have to, even if we can't be at the top in each one of these categories, we have to simultaneously become aware of them because this is what creates the nourishment that allows us to understand the context of the context. It allows us to see these intersections between our spheres of concern and our spheres of influence. Uh, otherwise, that is not a, you can't bring it together. If you just practice in a bubble, uh, you're not seeing these patterns emerge, which means it's not informing your practice. And I say this as a designer most broadly, not just as an architect. And so just to share share with you some of the research that has informed my work. This is what I call the kinetic city. Uh, it's the book and the essay that I've done. And I believe that, in my view, the framing of this phenomena under the rubric of, of the temporal landscape, ephemeral landscape, so what I call the kinetic city, is more inspirational as a category than saying this is the informal city and that's the formal city, because clearly binaries don't lead us to solutions. Design is about synthesis. It's about dissolving binaries. It's finding the third way. It's finding how you can reconcile these binaries. And therefore, I use the rubric of the kinetic city, which I have spent time observing. I've spent time mapping patterns of how, in stages, people over spatial, temporal kind of readings that you can actually occupy space, how it's linked to the index of security. You buy your way into the system. Sometimes it's corrupt, but you do. So there's a whole logic in way what we call the informal city works. Uh, and it's on a temporal scale. The moment you bring a temporal imagination to it, you begin to start seeing solutions. And of course, the spectacles of the kinetic city are not the same. What you see on the right is what I call the landscapes of impatient capital. Capital is highly impatient. So all the territories that allow capital to land and realize its value, the Dubais, the Shanghais, all of those, look like that. It's brittle urban form, because capital is only interested in realizing its value quickly. It's vendor-driven architecture. Architects are desperate in this thing. They make the buildings twist and turn a little bit. There is no spatial imagination often there, because the issues are completely different. In the kinetic city, you have both architecture, but architecture is only the backdrop for the temporal kind of landscape. Festivals, for example, Raghubir Singh, when he put the Ganesh immersion on the cover of his book, that was a powerful statement. He didn't put the skyline of the Rajabai Tower on Nariman Point because he recognized the spectacle of the city through the lens of a photographer and his imagination were the festivals. And here, the Ganesh festival is one example. Immersion actually becomes a metaphor for the spectacle of the city because as the clay idol dissolves in the water of the bay, the spectacle comes to a close. There are no static or permanent mechanisms to encode the spectacle. Here, the memory of the city is an enacted process, a temporal moment as opposed to buildings that contain the public memory as a static or permanent entity fixed in time and in space. It's a huge difference. Now, the kinetic city cannot be seen as a design tool. Rather, it's a demand that conceptions of urbanism create and facilitate environments that are versatile, flexible, robust, ambiguous, enough to allow 
the kinetic, the soft quality of the city to flourish. So it's not an argument for one or the other. My argument is you need both, and that's what this image shows you. You can't not make the human being centric to that imagination and the spectacles that come from human congregation and aggregation in space. And so the kinetic city are many examples. You see architecture built, which is spectacular, that's built for 10 days. I mean, I think for me that uh, the wonderful Maidans, that lovely game of cricket, uh, the, that Indian game of cricket that the British invented, and how the weddings sort of wrap around the pitch, the pitch is left sacred. But it's this synergy that is actually very powerful that we should recognize in terms of how we make space in the city. We extended this argument and turned kinetic into ephemeral and city into urbanism. And this is a book that's called Does Permanence Matter? Where we created a taxonomy where you have the ephemeral landscapes of transactions, which are markets of religion, like the Kummela, strife, which is earthquakes, disaster, wars, extraction, uh, which is mining towns. They have a different temporal scale. Mining towns last for 50 years, but they're temporal. You can predict when the copper is going to run out and the town has to be dismantled. Celebration. Uh, you know, all the way from Burning Man to many other things. Refuge, which is refugee camps and military. These are amazing examples, and we have mapped about 300 examples in this book of how the metrics of these actually play out to make urban space. Again, not to argue that we should only have cities that are temporary, but to argue we can learn from cities that have temporal occupations in the ways it can. Info. For example, I think in our development plan, we should have 30% of the land in Mumbai reserved for temporal uses on five years cycles, four-year cycles, so we can actually adapt and respond to needs of a time, rather than lack of, so does permanence matter, is the provocation of this argument. And one of the examples of this was a study that we did in the Kum Mela, which was I don't have to tell this group about it. It was a wonderful interdisciplinary project. But I want to just share with you the two, three things that for me were mind blowing. One was, of course, how in such a short time from at the confluence of the Ganges and the Yamuna, which is full of water in two months as the waters recede on the sand, a city of seven million people is built for occupation for 55 days, and then 120 million people visit it on those four or five days. It's the biggest gathering of human beings on the planet, and we manage it, right? It it was the cleanest Indian city I've ever lived in. I spent 10 days there. It was really the best run Indian city I've ever lived in. That's a before and after image. That image we took in October. And when we went back on Makar Sankranti in January, from that same spot, we saw a whole city that had emerged. Absolutely incredible operation. It's on a perfect grid. And the grid goes across the river on a pontoon bridge every road. So it's incredibly robust. It's not like Manhattan or many of our other cities where there are two bridges and those bridges fail, the whole city comes to a stop. Every road goes across here on a bridge. So the river can move around and you know, play around. <laughs> Even if there's a rain, unseasonal, the city is incredibly stable. So it's the deployment of a very rational system. But what was mind-boggling, one wondered and asked the question, why did, uh, this is a whole one-hour lecture, I'm just showing you the snippets that excite me the most, is this entire city is made out of five materials that you see here. Bamboo, which is eight feet tall, screws or nails, rope to tie things, a skinning material, which can either be corrugated sheet or plastic or fabric, which is there. That's it. The entire city is deployed from these five materials. That's why it gets assembled and disassembled so quickly. And you see every scale is addressed through that, from a small tent for four people to a big temple that can accommodate 600 people. That whole scale is addressed through these materials. It has the most sophisticated sanitation system which we mapped in great detail, the types of toilets, uh, the volumes of toilets, et cetera. So it was just amazing. All the things that we actually failed to do in our regular cities, it was just mind-blowing to see it deployed so efficiently here. This was really mind-blowing, which is what you see here uh, is an organizational hierarchical chart, and it shifts. So even the governance system and who's in charge is on a temporal scale. The chief minister starts the operation. It moves to a Mela Adhikari over four or five months. When the Mela is on, 
between the divisional commissioner and the Mela Adhikari, they make all the decisions. And you know, what an incredible example, say for what we are dealing with climate change. We have a municipal commissioner, the poor man has to deal all the way from electricity, sewage, trains, everything. We actually need a system with the flux that we are dealing with, where hierarchies can actually change overnight to address an issue, and the whole system can fall into place. So temporality, the notion of time, is something that has been so absent in planning and architecture, but it actually is the space where we can look for many solutions if we can creatively deploy our thinking around the temporal scale. Material geography, where material comes from, where it gets reabsorbed, talking about cyclic sort of cycles of material use. It, it gets reabsorbed in the villages from where it comes or from other places it comes, it goes back to the villages. So this deployment of material cycles was mind-blowing. And of course, it's phenomenal that this lasts for 55 days. You know, we went on the last day to thank the high priestess who had really been our mentor to help us on this. And, you know, I went and thanked her and I said, you know, we've learned so much from infrastructure structure, governance, this, that. She kept smiling like I was some crackpot, you know. And I was all excited about everything I'd learned in terms of planning. And she just put her hand on my head and said, feel blessed the Mother Ganges let you sit in her lap for a few days. You know, it was that kind of attitude, but it, it is what I call an exercise in detachment. Uh, and people spend the most incredible effort knowing in 55 days it's ephemeral. I think there's a lot to learn both inspirationally, but also in terms of the strategies. Now. I want to remind everyone that this Kummela city is formal, it's a state operation. It's not an informal city. People say, oh my God, looks like an informal. It's intentional, every decision is intentional. They have 10,000 sweepers who clean the city every day, and it's deliberate. Yeah, so we shouldn't get caught in the aesthetics of what's formal and informal, and this is where I mean how we have to, as designers, blur the binaries of everything we think of. The moment you set things up as binaries, you don't find the solution. And so this looks like an informal city, but after studying it so carefully, I think it's probably the most formal, the most intentional, the most deliberate city I know in the country, right? So that's really, and so from this kind of study, what does one learn? One has to actually reinvent even the jargon. Uh, I have to think about the impatience of capital and how can I make capital more patient. Capital becomes very patient when it resides in foundations and institutions. But when it resides with a corporate sector, it's very impatient. Or with developers, it's very impatient. How do I create a more elastic imaginary of space? How do I think about incrementalism uh, as a strategy in our economy? How do I appropriate, reappropriate, deappropriate space, reversibility? How do I create soft thresholds in terms of addressing questions of inequity, temporality, transitions? How does one move our minds into thinking in terms of transitionary thinking for many, many aspects of our city? And how do we leave a minimum trace? So let me just zoom out for a second. Bear with me. I'm sorry, I'm maybe taking too much time in this research. I hope it's interesting to you. This is the new research, which I hope will be out as a book in six months, where we are just asking the question, what is urban in India? We keep saying urban India, rural India. I don't, I don't see the difference, and I'm not sure. So this was a research we embarked 10 years ago. And because of the pandemic, it was interrupted. And I have to finish it before the next census comes out, which is also delayed. So if you look at India, this is urban India. This is the government's imagination of urban India. What is it? There are three criteria for urban India. I don't know how many people know this, but a, a, a settlement has to have more than 5,000 people. It has to have a density of more than 400 people per square kilometer. The density of Houston is 240 people per square kilometer. So this is a very high density. Yeah, it's, it's double the density of most American cities. And the last one, which is very bizarre, is that 75% of the male, popul male population have to be in non-agriculture. This is all colonial stuff that comes around, right? So now these three criteria define a town to be urban or not, which means then based on that, they get a municipality, they get funding or not. Big decisions are made on these criteria. So we see urban India as a lot of small and big dots, almost with no correlation to each other. So what we did was we said, Let's get data at the rural level, which was data we had to buy, which was very expensive, needed funding. And we said, let's break it down to the village level and see what patterns emerge. So we made a map for each one of the criteria uh, to deconstruct this. And what we saw was very amazing. If you look at the minimum population of 5,000 people, urban India looks like what you see in the first map. If you take the criteria of density, then all the way from Kashmir to Calcutta, 
200 miles wide is the world's biggest mega city. It's continuous urbanization. Sometimes density is going up to 2,000 people per square. It's a completely different reading, and you see the density along the edges. If you take the criteria of 75 of the male population, that mega city disappears because everyone living in the Gangetic Plain is coming to Mumbai, Delhi to work, not and doing both things, doing three jobs, four jobs. It's seasonal. So the maps we've made are actually very interesting. We've done cycles of rice cropping, wheat cropping, based on seasonal cycles, how urban India changes. But essentially, the conclusion, if I had to just in a one line say it, in urban India, or sorry, not in urban India, in India, 300 million people are in continuous flux. They are moving between places. They are not in a stable location, uh, at least. Now, what is emerged from the research is what we need to pay attention to is transitioning settlements. And these are settlements that are, uh, are, are ones we should anticipate, which are, they are not defined as urban, but they have all the characteristics of being urban. So sometimes they are, and we have mapped these, they are 130,000 people yet defined as a village run by a panchayat because they don't meet one of the criteria, right? And so there are hundreds of towns, like the 13,650 towns that have no sanitation, they have no municipality, they are not, they are defined as being rural because they don't meet the criteria. So we have to, of course, nuance it. Now, why am I showing you this? Because, you know, these settlements don't have piped water, they don't have sanitation. The question is, what will these settlements look like? Will they look urban or will they look rural? Uh, what is the form implications of this? This also tells us that everything we are doing in cities like Mumbai, the big towns, the secondary towns, is so off the mark. What is the only metric we are using in housing? 1 BHK, 2 BHK, 3 BHK, 4 BHK, right? What we need are youth hostels, what we need are settlements where workers who come for six weeks to work can live and go back home. They don't want to bring their families. How that's the kind of things we have to address through flux. The markets for those are massive. The demands for those are massive. But if we have the wrong data, we are, we are locating our airports, our train systems, the Mumbai-Delhi corridor that we are investing, huge amount, it's all in the wrong place because it has nothing to do with this correlation. Uh, and now in these maps, we've also looked at hydrology, water tables, we've looked at all of that, and then you begin to get the logic of what is locating where, and the government is working often counter to that. And so therefore, again, I think it's contingent on the academy, it's contingent on all of us to begin to address these questions. So sanitation is a big thing. This map I want to just spend a minute on, and these, this is not a criticism because, you know, uh, in today's climate, I want to clarify, it's not a criticism, it's an ob observation. You can read it as a criticism. So the pandemic-induced reverse migration only reinforces, I mean, the government statistic was 11 million people walked home. IIM did a thing, 30 million people walked home. Let's say 30 million people. But they walked home because of the reasons I was telling you. They are moving. 300 million people are moving. Now, you look at the orange here uh, and the red. Those are the poorest percentage of the states. That's where the poor live. So that's where you have populist, so you know which governments reside in which parts. So the poorest, uh, the poorest states need populist schemes, right? If you have populist schemes, you get the votes, right? So this map then tells you that. You look at the geography, you look at the Indo-Gangetic Plain, that's where that mega city is, right? There are more people living in that Indo-Gangetic Plain than all of Europe combined, right? And that's where climate change is going to hit you the most in terms of flooding, in terms of dislocation, and in terms of this flux. Unless we read these patterns to anticipate whether we are, we are in the business of creating consumer goods, we are in the business of creating housing, or we are architects, we'll all miss the target because we are not seeing the patterns correctly. And this is why I think the nestle scales, looking across scales, understanding and discerning these patterns is very critical to understand the nature of interventions we make. So these are maps we made from that, and now what you find is the worst disease, malnutrition, lack of sanitation, is in that Indo-Gangetic Plain, the world's biggest uh, mega city. Clearly, because the density is highest, the most areas, it's not urban, it's rural, all the transitioning settlements are, are, are going there. And you know, the people, I mean, the, the group that gets hit 
the most in this whole process are women. This is Toilet, a love story, which captures very well the shock of this urban woman who goes and lives in the village where she's married to understand there's no toilet facilities and they walk a few miles every day, you know, to, to defecate in the open. And those are the kinds of effects that it has on the lives of women and on families, which is incredibly critical. Actually, Bollywood is capturing this better than we as planners and architects are capturing. And they are capturing the pulse and the insight on this. So inspired by that, we began to create a map of what it means. That might be the image of the Indian city in most of these transitioning towns if we don't take our work more seriously. I'm sorry that's provocative, but that's what life is going to be in this country if we don't look at sanitation. Now, the government, I think, has great programs. And this is where design can play a big role. This is why Conscious Collective is very important, because these are absolute solutions. Okay, let's make four million toilets in some factory, put it outside everyone's house. We know they're being used for cupboards to store jewelry and grain, because they're the most pakka structure in the whole village. Right? These are absolute solutions. You have to look at transitionary solutions. So the advertisement shows you the London telephone booth, which is like a toilet. And that poor grandfather, his grandson is motivated to make him use the toilet instead of going to the field, but is he going to go into a, you know, a telephone booth to defecate? Not likely. So this is a design problem, and we can't go to individual sanitation till we make a transition through community transition, uh, through community sanitation. You can't get a toilet in every house in that slum. It has to be community. So it is transitions before transformations in all aspects when you're looking at a world which is, or a country, or a state, or a city in flux. In Mumbai, the toilets generate one crore rupees per day for the poor to use it, uh, the solubs and things. That's massive. So we are actually charging the poorest in our communities to make that kind of revenue uh, in a day. It's pathetic in terms of what the state can actually do. And so those are community toilets that are self-built, and those are what the government builds. So with Spark, we got involved and developed a prototype uh, to have a thing off the grid, solar panels, green, uh, you know, have flowers on the facade. So if people pluck flowers for puja, they have different associations with the building. We did all the good things architects imagine. And of course, we completely failed. It got disused. The community sarpanch took it over. I don't know. There was, this is a whole story I can tell. But ever tried, ever failed. No matter, try again, fail again, fail better. These are wicked problems that we have to going at. I feel young architects don't address many of these because failure is clear. You don't want to fail when you're starting. I think that's the support systems that we need as a profession to create. So we entered a Bill Gates funded competition. We won the first prize. It was international, where we made it into a hub with shops and with sanitation things that were sold there, embedded it in the community. We even provocatively put it across the temple. We won the first prize. But when I went to the NGO to try to build it, they said, no, no, we couldn't wait for the competition. We gave it to some contractor to build, and they built the standard toilet. So then we ran a studio at Harvard. We looked at extreme urbanism, we looked at sanitation as infrastructure. From that, we've now developed a whole manual with tender documents, pricing, quantities, where we have looked at imagining what I'm calling a sanitation hub, which is a much more complex imagination of what the public toilet is. You need a Trojan horse to bring sanitation to our communities. If you just say, that's a toilet, go use it, no one is going to. So how do you embed this facility of sanitation within clinics, within all sorts of other things? And these are kinds of diagrams we've de developed to create those relationships to understand how, and then we've designed it and we've looked at different situations, urban situations, which are transitioning settlements. What would be the vocabulary of building there? What are the crafts that you have for building? What are the materials? From that, how do you create? What are the needs? How do you create a prototype which can be dismantled and moved if somebody else solves the problem of individual? We've looked at high-density formal settlements like slums. It's a whole different problem in terms of a kit of parts. So this has all been developed in great detail, and now we are waiting for a patron who might actually take it. It's on the on, on Online, anyone can download it, any NGO can use it to be inspired to build these things. And how they might look, how they can be built, how they get of parts, how they can be removed, how they can be recycled. So it's transition, not absolute solutions. This is a big shift we have to make because the provocation is, are we making permanent solutions for temporary problems? We have to understand what problems on a temporal scale are likely to go away. Or we can plan for 20 years, not 60 years. We tend to make everything permanent. And so modes of engagement come in here again. Now I'm going to go to architecture so I can go to the practices. These are the kinds of books we have worked on. Uh, and 
For me, these are instruments of advocacy. These are not research projects in themselves, but they are instruments from which one can then advocate. Uh, and just to come to architecture, this is one that looked at South Asia, which I learned a lot from in terms of emerging practices. And then we did a book which is called Architecture in India Since 1990, which uh, my pu publisher friend Padmini, who's here in the audience, bet on. It was a very risky book because it was about writing the history of the present. And so this book has, it was written in, nine, in 2000, uh, 2010, and it was looking at what happened to India after liberalization. And it basically said that if you take the lens of modernism out, what do you see? And you see Akshar Dham, you see hundreds of mega temples, you see things that we otherwise, as a profession, don't want to look at because for aesthetic reasons, they are not inspirational to us. And so it was really about writing the history of the present, which was very risky. Uh, and it was a book that identified what are the modes of practice that were emerging. Again, to make the argument that we have to look at, we have to look at the impatience of capital. We can't avoid it if we want to change the built environment. And we also have to look at the resurfacing of the ancient if we have to change the built environment. We can't have blind spots like that. And of course, that got converted to an exhibition. And what's interesting here, I'll just show you one panel. This drawing here, what you see as stacked up here are the schools of architecture. And we had from two schools, 420 schools when we did this exhibition. And what is amazing is the growth of the schools explode when real estate as a word is used and it's formalized as a sector. It's absolutely counterintuitive. So what happens is parents are driving their kids around, and I, I don't say this as criticism, as observation, uh, in Vikroli, and they see 40 buildings built with 300 apartments in each building. And they say, my god, the real estate sector is booming. So you must study architecture. So they send their kids to architecture school. What they don't realize is the 500 families they see housed here is done by one architect who's done a standard plan, which in permutations or two architects has, if you had the same paradigm as defense colony in Delhi, for 500 families, at least 200 architects would be employed. So the employment changes and it's related to form. And we, don't, we are not recognizing that. In fact, we should be having less schools, not more, if we are going to go into the paradigm of high-rise buildings and, and get a development where single architects actually produce a lot. So it's not a criticism of the high-rise building as such, which is a whole different discussion, but what signal that we read as academics, as architects from that. So the exhibition surfaced these sorts of disjunctures. Again, it's about reading the patterns that we want. And this is a pitch I'm going to make. This is a conference we are doing uh, next week in Delhi, where we have gathered 40 architects from South Asia, uh, and we're releasing a book that's looking at 41 practices of architects under 40. We purposely chose 41, so we didn't have a cheesy title called 40 Under 40. And so it's 41 practices. And it's amazing what you learn from it. You'll see the book. Um, it sounds like a pitch, but I'm saying this sincerely. That what young architects are doing, how they are discerning these patterns, how they are creating forms of patronage, how they are addressing clients, how they are addressing inequity, is just mind-blowing and very, very inspiring. So research, to end this section before I quickly go through the projects, you know, we have to be careful as a profession that research is not driven by practice. So I've got a project on housing, so let me research housing. That's what is happening. Research is about asking questions where you don't know where you're going. And then from that, you can discern and be inspired to what questions you should address. And I think that, for me, has been the biggest learning. For example, the books I did, again, Padmini published the first one, which was, for me, seminal in many ways. Uh, with Sharda Devedi, were books we were doing because we were reading the images and the uh, patterns in Mumbai. But then that re led in con con collaboration with Bombay Environmental Action Group, Cyrus Gazdar, Sham Chenani, many others, into legislation for the Fort area, which led to you know, the Kala Ghoda Festival to conserve those buildings. It led to even contemporary interventions at the Prince of Wales Museum. We didn't do the research because we wanted to do this. This came out of what we recognized was the need of the R. And so the modes of engagement become very, very critical. And so context matters, how we discern the context matters, what are the instruments of advocacy so that we have agency and voice as a profession matters. And then I'm going to now show you these propositions. I'm gonna quickly, I'll go through this very fast because I have only 25 minutes. Uh, a homes, a couple of homes and what interests us, livelihoods that are workspaces, amenities which are institutions and dwelling when you aggregate them. Yeah, and so I'll start with this sort of uh, 
uh, what happens in Mumbai, everyone builds in Alibagh. Uh, and so everyone's, and everyone's building in Alibagh. And uh, I will not name the person who owns this house, but I remember meeting the contractor of this house on the boat. And I said, oh, he said, I'm doing so-and-so's house. And I, he showed me an image of this. And I said, wow, who's the architect who did this? He said, there's no architect. She gave me a picture of the White House in Washington, said, built it exactly like that. So I built it. So what you get are these imaginaries of villas, uh, of assertions of power, of wealth. But what you get is huge disjunctures between rural and urban communities. And how does one actually use design in a way that you create that soft threshold? So this is a house we did in 2000, long, 23 years ago, where we this is the living room. It's a veranda that's open for the caretaker's family to hang out in. The bedrooms are in that wall. The water collects in the, through the roof. There's a tap through an open well, which is open to the villagers to come and look at it, or to use it. So it creates a soft threshold where it doesn't, because these people live here, what, five weekends in a year. Let the caretaker and his family use it. I've seen a wedding happen here. they are friends who meet here. It softens that threshold. It's reversible. The stone is local stone, but the roofs can be reversed very, very easily. Uh, and, but it, yet you bring an elegance and an articulation to it. It's not a matter of doing it sloppily. But there's another agenda that drives it. This is a house for a very well-known doctor, uh, a youngish doctor, uh, who could have afforded a villa, and he wanted a villa. And he wanted a villa like the Washington, D.C. White House. And we had to work with him to say that if you are at the edge of the village here, this village is going to grow around you. You should get integrated in the village. So we fragmented the houses, also with the agenda that it, could it be a paradigm where a middle class person could build this incrementally, build one room, add a room. So this is the living room, kitchen, dining. That's self-sufficient. You could use one as a bedroom. This is a pool with a doctor's study and a guest room. And this is a family unit with three bedrooms for the kids and the family, so they're isolated. So it's fragmented. It sits better in the landscape. It's incremental, so as a model, it could be used by you know, even a family that wanted to build it incrementally. It's very simple material, series of courtyards that sort of go through it. Uh, the pool is discreet uh, because, again, this polarity that you have gardeners working and growing things and you're swimming and bathing. So it's very discreet. It's a room. Again, architecture can play a big role in being mindful of these polarities that exist. These are the binaries between the rich, the poor, the urban, the rural that we have to address through our agency uh, to blur. But of course, you can articulate it better. You can create a much, much softer sort of uh, 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 relationship with what's around it. You can collect water in beautiful ways. This is inspired by a Japanese house where the screens shift. So if the family's there alone together, they open all the rooms, it becomes one big space. Or they, if they have guests who need privacy, they put the blinds down. Uh, so it, it basically is modules which are incremental, which not only responds to the landscape, but also has an economic implication as a model, as an experiment. We come to workspaces. This is our first project in 1994. Uh, it was uh, for LMW, which is a big machine tool company. Uh, and they, uh, the owner called me in and he said, that's our brief. We've talked to an Australian. This was right when we were liberalizing our economy. He said, I've talked to an Australian glazing guy. They're shipping out glazing and bringing it here. My heart sank because I was full of I idealism. But I don't know what came upon me and him. But I convinced him to actually let this lie down on the ground and not have a garden with a fountain here and parking at the back and seven floors, but do a series of courtyards through which people could move. The building is co totally ventilated, uh, it's, so it's a series of courtyards. It's got a 20,000 square foot uh, Mangalore tile roof. Uh, I felt at that point where we were liberalizing our economy and embracing the world, we should be creating our own identity and not doing stupid uh, curtain glazed buildings from the West. And so it's a completely different experience. Water circulates to cool it. The courtyards are telescopic in the way the green comes into this. Uh, it's all single loaded corridors, so every room is ventilated. We didn't design it for air conditioning. And what's very interesting, I feel very old now, uh, 35 years later, we have just prepared a conservation report for this building because they've done nothing for 30 years. And now they want to retrofit it for Wi Fi, for air conditioning, for new needs. So I'm suddenly making a conservation report for our own building, which is really a fascinating experience. And as you come to the owner's rooms, it actually becomes more intimate. Uh, that's a very young uh, Rajiv Sethi 
and Manjeet Bawa, who collaborated with us and Yogesh Rawal on all the building elements, including the railings. Uh, Manjeet did the railings using his figures, but embossed in copper, uh, and a series of other works, which I don't have the time to show. Rajiv helped us create from wasted granite strips a waterfall with the lotus. Uh, the Jali Yogesh Rawal created from scrap metal from the machine tool factory. So we went into the machine tool factory and we took all the scrap and layered it to create these Jalis for cross ventilation. Uh, and you have incredible patterns, there are 24 patterns, including these large portals. Uh, this is another office which is more recent. It's for an infrastructure company. Again, I'm trying to show you how talking about sustainability, cross-ventilation, water, these simple things can actually create beautiful environments, but also address the question. We don't have to use a chemical and a mechanical fix for everything to make it green. Uh, and here, what inspired us for this infrastructure company, uh, sorry, for this company, they had a site, it's in Cyberabad, everything was a glass box here. And I noticed that in Andhra Pradesh, before they split the state, everyone had fishing nets on their buildings because there were riots and people would throw stones on these glass buildings. So the curtain glazing vendors, actually when they sold you the glass, they gave you a choice of the color of the fishing net to protect the glass. So it seemed like a very bizarre thing. And we were inspired by this little hut in Jaipur where it's a water cooler. Uh, and there's a, a business association with the government. They set up these huts, that guy works for them. And he puts out his kettle and he's ready to give people water. And he gives people water free of charge, there's no plastic cups, they just cup their hand, they drink the water, they say thank you. Very beautiful gesture, it's made out of thatch. 200 of these are put up in Jaipur in the summer. That was so deeply inspirational to us. So we did a building which is a five floor high garden on all sides, it has a misting system which actually mists to cool the plants and to keep the plants wet so that the, water, the, air, the hot air going through the facade actually cools the building and every facade looks different. So the same patterns you can do with colored aliquot bond, you can do with plants. It's even, you know, they, and also the impatience of capital, they wanted the building in 12 months, we gave it to them, the cows came and blessed it and we took a year or two to make the facade so they could actually work. So it was also reconciling both the patience and impatience. We handcrafted the trellis from recycled aluminum in a very local small village, very close, so which we were very happy about. Uh, and that's what the building feels like, looks like. Uh, people are curious about it. It's also interesting sectionally in the way it takes air out and ventilates relationships sectionally. That building got a LEED certificate that you see there. That's like the walkie-talkie building that melted the car. Uh, they got a LEED certificate and that's all about a chemical and mechanical fix. We couldn't get a LEED certificate and finally the clients were happy enough that we showed them through temperature and humidity readings they didn't need a LEED certificate. So sometimes these standards work against you. But those are the heroes of the building. These are the gardeners that keep the building. And you know what is interesting and I'm going to read a quote very quickly from Marty Chen who's a sociologist at Harvard. She said, and she says this in the context of economics, she said what is needed most fundamentally is a new economic paradigm, a model of a hybrid economy that embraces the traditional and the modern, the small scale and the big scale, the informal and the formal. What is needed is an economic model that allows the smallest unit and the least powerful worker to operate alongside the largest unit and the most powerful uh, player. And for me, this building, in a sense, did that. This an intern from our office from Panama City took, and it moved me when I saw this, because these workers who are the lowest paid, who would otherwise not even come in the eyes of the owners, they actually can wink or say hello to the bosses who sit in there. And no one puts their blinds down because they've become friends. They ask them for bouquets. They co-mingle with the workers to create this sort of threshold. So, I mean, we didn't design it for this. This is the kind of feedback we got, which was very important. At the building itself, uh, you know, it miss uh, the green grows, the green changes. The trellis has a misting system uh, built into it. Uh, and so this was when the plants had just started growing. So you can do the mist for atmosphere, sometimes they do that, but to otherwise keep the plants cool. It's all serviced through hydroponic trays, so the water used is very little. It's about now 15 years old and yet operating, so one is very happy about that. And you can do different sectors depending on the species. You can increase the misting on a hot day. People come to just sort of get wet uh, sometimes, or you can create it you know, in very kind of atmospheric ways. Uh, and so it, it kind of has its own character. It's got a solar panel roof. This is when it became a woolly monster and it needed a haircut. 
haircut, so this was just before they gave it a haircut. Uh, the conference rooms don't have green, so you get views. Uh, but this is the peak of summer, where some things burn out on the east, etc. But it's a five-story high garden that, in comparison to everything else, has its own presence uh, in that sort of landscape. How does one take these principles? I'm going to end with just two more projects. How does one take these principles further? So this was a project we were invited to do in Basel in Switzerland. Uh, it's a campus that Novartis has, and they are very interested in architecture. So I think so far they've built 20 buildings, and they've had architects from different countries. Uh, and you know, it's a very strong grid, so there's not much they can do. There was one triangular plot, so they naturally gave it to Frank Gehry because he's the only one who could deal with the triangle. So he twisted and turned things in interesting ways. Uh, and uh, we were asked from India to do it. So these are some of the architects who have built there. And ours was the most recent building, uh, which the garden hadn't been developed. This is an old image. So it was really working with a galaxy of wonderful architects, and one learned a lot. Uh, and one, you know, we had just done this building in Hyderabad, and I was thinking, how do we take these principles? So that was our concept. Now, what struck me, and I, again, don't mean this as a criticism, but an observation, is none of the other 19 architects question the plan. Uh, they got obsessed with what the facades would be. Uh, that's become a very Western paradigm, partly because the legislation, legal stuff in the West is so severe, they don't want to fiddle with anything, don't take any risks, so concentrate on the facade, do really incredibly well-articulated facade. We question, maybe coming from Bombay, where you question, try to find every loophole. So we said that this is a lab floor. This is what the business is. Every building there, 19 buildings, had the elevator, staircase, and the ducts like this. So you had a very clear hierarchy. It took us three months to convince the consultants, but we fragmented it. So we got a clean floor plate. Once we got a clean floor plate, we could do huge amounts of things. That was one question. We, uh, uh, the other we did was, why do you have to have every floor that's five meters? Labs need five meters. Offices don't need five meters. So we made the office areas only 2.4 meters, which is eight feet. And the extra FAR that was left, we carved out to make a greenhouse in the center. So again, it was a shift in the paradigm. So we got an elevation like that, which was much more transparent. That became the section. There was a whole greenhouse in the center, which cools and heats the building. Uh, uh, and this was done by Gunther Wo, who is a, a Swiss uh, landscape designer. He created the facade as an indicator of the seasons, so there are 24 species used. So something blooms at some time in the year, and it kind of uh, changes. Uh, and that's what the facades look like. The glass building on the other side is by uh, uh, Mr. Maki from Japan. Uh, we used much more earthy materials from the Basel quarries and the green facade. And that's what the plans are. You get glimpses of the labs as you go through it. But the offices sit in the garden. Uh, and that's the Rhine River that is framed right through it. So between the labs and the offices, there's a garden, and it's completely open. And so the relationship also, in terms of the human beings there, is much greater. It's much more social. It's very much imagined as a human being being centric to it. The labs are very rigorous labs designed by Toshiko Mori, a Japanese architect. But the lab workers can come out and have their discussions. The staircases are all go through the garden. There are meeting rooms with flat screen TVs in the garden. So people can come out there and meet. And it's also an operational productive garden in terms of the fact that it acts as a greenhouse. And the scientists have the green facade where they can stay within the labs but yet do their work and enjoy uh, the green. Now we come to institutions where this was SEPT University. It's an architecture school. I'm an alum there. And I was asked to design the first non-doshi building, which was a library. It was a very scary thought. Uh, but it was a very interesting project. Uh, they asked uh, for a building that would be six stories high, because that was a requirement. And that was something I just couldn't do at a place I had studied in. So we used the height as a datum, and we did a building that went three floors under the ground. And it became a series of nestled buildings that went into the basement. But it takes light down all the way, so you don't feel a sense of claustrophobia. Because when you do a basement as slabs, Claustrophobia is what you have to deal with. So it was, again, a paradigm shift in terms of responding to a modern historic environment. So that's what the building turned out to be. Uh, it was a big roof with louvers. That's a skin that just modulates the climate. And then the building sits uh, into the ground. These are RCC walls, which are form finished. They get lighter as you go down in terms of the pigmentation, so they reflect light better. The louvers can be operated and fixed at many permutations. Uh, and at the, above the ground, then, it's a very intimate uh, building in many ways. It also relates to the scale of the rest of the campus. It creates these transitionary spaces. 
You see the courtyard and the glass blocks that take the light down. And what is interesting is in section, we had to modulate it. This is how you enter it. Uh, this is how the pigmentation changes and it gets lighter. And within it is much more intimate. Uh, the infrastructure is all integrated in the, in the book stacks. What, the trick here was to slip again, like in the Novartis building, to slip the sections. So for some areas, you needed three meter height, some you could do eight, meter, eight feet, so you could lift a building, a book. And so therefore, you get a slippage. It's like three buildings sitting within each other which have their own sectional logic, which means your views on the diagonal get extended enormously so you never feel a sense of claustrophobia because you're looking down at a diagonal, often down two or three levels. And so that was the small trick that allowed the, it to create both intimacy but also the feeling of a piece of infrastructure. And that is the challenge in institution buildings because they become large infrastructures. But how do you bring it down to the scale also of the student? And that's what the building feels like on the outer skin. Those are louvers and a catwalk where you can operate the louvers. Uh, and as you go down, uh, it becomes concrete as a base, and when you go under the ground, it becomes white concrete, and when you go lower, then you have the skylights that sort of bring the light uh, down even further. Uh, it's, it has four bridges that connect it. These are carols for PhD students, uh, and it's all the raw concrete, which in that dry climate uh, works very well. And at the lowest level, you have the light coming down on the concrete, so you also get a sense of the natural light, even at the lowest level, uh, below the ground, below even the first basement. Uh, level and then you have this sense of intimacy but yet uh, it's a piece of infrastructure as institutional buildings uh, must actually uh, be. And that's what it feels like. It's raw concrete. There are no beams, columns. These are portals. So it's very minimal, and it's very raw in its, in its expression. And you can modulate the light and the air from that outer facade. We also made a manual of how the students could actually modulate it to study climate. I won't go into that. At night, it reverses, and you have a porosity within. So it has a different kind of presence. We've taken that further in a building for the School of Arts and Sciences, where the building is designed as a lab, because I mean, as an armature, because it has lab it has literature, it has poetry, it has chemistry, physics, all sorts of things. And so we created an armature with the services, allowing flexibility so each bay could be changed over time. If a lab needed to become bigger, smaller, you needed a terrace, you needed a classroom. So within each bay, there's enormous flexibility using a kit of parts. There are gardens, there are louvers, and there's glass, and then there's colored surfaces. It is completely cross-ventilated through it, and so that you don't need air conditioning for about 50% of the space. It's a very systemic kind of uh, armature, uh, which allows this kind of flexibility. And then within the armature, it's carved out in a way that you get interesting spaces. You get voids, you get gardens, you get terraces, you get different moments that students can sit in. The entrance is, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's much more generous as you walk in. The provost can look over who's coming in and out. It's got a sense of enigma in it. You quite don't know what's behind these windows. Uh, the library creates a kind of intimacy. It's almost treated like a building within a building. So these volumes then help with that idea of the scale, places for people to sit. I'll pause here. This was a project I wasn't going to show you. But 48 hours ago, I had the misfortune of having to go to Chandanwadi in Bombay because a very close friend passed away, so I went for his cremation. I was so appalled. And this is a project that's not finished, and that's why I wasn't going to show it. But I'm going to show it because I was so appalled at what I saw there in Chandanwadi. You know, we are situating our entire identity on our religion, and the way we take care of our dead through those ceremonies is so bloody appalling. And this is a project we've been struggling with for four years. It's a project we are doing with Antim Sansta, that's an NGO. They approached us that we should work together to improve the Ambedkar crematorium in Worli. Uh, and we did an MOU with the BMC. And we've been struggling because I realized even within the state, the imagination and the priority for a crematorium is so low. We designed a master plan. We built half of it. And the metro came along and said, we are taking half your land because we need to store the material. I said, you can't find a place to store the material anywhere else? No. The BMC hasn't shown up for any meeting we've called for. In a week, this is being handed over to the BMC uh, to run. Uh, because Antim Sansta, they were going to run it for five years. We thought we would run it for five years so we could set a benchmark. And then that way the city would expect something. So it would be pressure on the government. But now they're ending their MOU because they just can't deal with it. Uh, we can't deal with this at all. 
And it's really appalling because actually we've raised the money. Every big industrial house in Bombay, I, five weeks ago I went to a friend and raised 15 lakhs to do landscape because they wouldn't give us money to put plants in. And so it's the city has participated in it and I'm just afraid that it's just going to go to pot. And after going there and experiencing things at Chandanwadi, I just thought, I must just show it to you because the more people who know what we need to do, the better it is. So this is a glimpse. It's five piles. I mean, sorry, it's eight piles. So it's a very big crematorium. It's non-denominational, which means Parsis, Muslims, Hindus, everyone gets cremated here. It's not only for Hindus. We've played here with light. What inspired us here was the matka and the breaking of the pot, which is so symbolic. So one picked up on that form, and that was a form that allowed us to modulate light in very interesting ways. And this is the master plan that we made. These are the pyres, and you come through here. So this is a large area for congregation. There's a big courtyard now. This the metro has taken, so our entrance has become that small. Uh, and this is how the courtyards bring light, so every group that sits there actually is exposed to nature. Uh, that's what it looks like in terms of form. Uh, you have an entrance courtyard uh, from which you enter and then you have large waiting areas. These are where ashes can be kept and administration. And then you go to the pyres individually so you have privacy. So eight can happen at the same time. This is the entrance court which we imagined would become green with plants growing on the gabion. But now it's cut down and this has been taken over uh, in part for storage. And now what we are left with is an entrance area that yet you come with nature, plants, the gabion walls will have green. You have very generous areas to wait in. Uh, light is modulated to give you different moods at different times of the day. And then you enter these eight matkas, in a sense, uh, which is round the corner, which starts the ceremonial route. Uh, and you go through where the light drops. Uh, and then you come into each one of the pyre areas where, like, unlike Chandanwadi, you don't go to a different room. It all happens within the family in that room. Everything is made in stone so it can be hosed down and cleaned very easily. Uh, and it's mechanized solid granite on which the body can lie. There's a skylight which, you know, celebrates uh, that moment. Uh, and, and there are courtyards that allow you to reconnect with nature. And that light is modulated as you leave the mood changes and it's much brighter uh, and you connect with the outer world. I don't know what will happen to it, but I just thought I should uh, share it because it is about celebrating death. Uh, it's about the modulation of light. Uh, and I will just end in five, three seconds with this fast. This is a project in Jaipur. I just want to show it only because it's a low cost housing project where we've actually worked with nature. This was an example where we designed the water system and nature for the elephants, the 100 elephants who live here. And the houses were put in the interstitial spaces. And then from March 2007 to 17, we transformed the site just by holding the water and managing the systems. And it's low cost housing where the elephants have courtyards, they have a lot of space. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's low cost housing where it's transformed through that kind of natural uh, 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 modulation and the courtyard. So even the richest in Jaipur get water tankers to, for their lawns. Here the poorest can grow flowers because they have more water than they need. So it's a way, this is what I mean by the instrumentality of architecture. It can actually shift an inequity if you work on it very strategically. And you know, it's now provided them amenities and jobs. Uh, it's an infrastructure project. Parts of the site have become like forests. Uh, it's the wetness that we thought was very important because it also, it, in the monsoon, the waters fill. Uh, in the, uh, in the uh, summer, it recedes. It was a very complicated project. Uh, it involved many governments. We were the only steady one there. And I will just end in a minute by saying the two things one learned from these experiences is as architects, we have to look at the client in much more nuanced ways. You could argue the, client, the planet is your client, but every client has embedded within it a patron, an operational client, and a user. In a single family house, which is why we architects love doing it, is this collapses into one entity. So our frictions, unless there's a couple who's squabbling, your frictions are very minimal. But if you do a government project or you do an institution, the patron client would be the provost or the president or the chief minister who has a vision, hopefully, and has the money. The operational client is the campus engineer, or the PWD, et cetera. And the, operation, and the user clients are the users. Often as architects, we align with one of these components. Uh, we never align with all three. And I think the elephant village, which we did Hathigaon, which took 15 years, 
taught me the lesson because I was the only one, or we as architects were the only one who could access all three of those clients. So getting them on the table collectively actually helped the project. That was a big lesson and a plea to the profession that we have to have discussions about how that happens. And I just end with the fact is, at least my, in retrospect, 32 years of practice, a lot of it was intuitive, we were doing things, we were getting excited about research, we were doing X, Y, and Z, but in retrospect, I think for me, the emblem is how we do stuff that allows our spheres of concerns to expand all the time, because that's necessary, but then how do we also expand simultaneously our spheres of influence? And I think that is going to be the challenge for the profession of designers in the future, because we have to get agency. If you don't have agency, we don't have a voice in society, we might as well not practice architecture, but I hope we will make that change and practice architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rahul. I think uh, your presentation set the tone for these two days. Um, me, as a design enthusiast, uh, the more I listen to you, the more I am richer in terms of my, not just my vocabulary with, with architecture in general, but just understanding the, co the complex ecosystem that is our country in terms of, especially the last time, that we, and we've already discussed this, the spheres of concern and the spheres of uh, influence. influence. How do we align them? How do we get them aligned, not just as architects, but just as people who are responsible for taking some action, right? And on that note, maybe we can ask some questions to the audience. Uh, I think given the time, let's try to stick to one or two questions. So do we have any questions from the audience for Rahul? Anyone? Yes? Yes, Karthik. Yeah. Can we have the mic to Karthik, please? Yeah. Karthik, if you want to introduce yourself to, yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Karthik. I'm a researcher in a think tank in New Delhi. Um, I mean, everything elegant and, you know, functional that you've shown almost seems like it's out of the reach for the poor. I mean, it, I mean, as I said, just by the sheer elegance, right? It, it's almost like elegance is equated to having the monetary ability to sort of, you know, support it. And that seems to be the reason why we're denigrating to, you know, these uh, mass-built things, right, where we're not giving enough thought to this. So would you disagree that, uh, you know, that elegance necessarily comes at a certain cost and a price, and that given the current economic paradigm, we can still sort of make this happen at scale? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I could have shown other things, and I could have spent more time on the last project, which is all about that in terms of what the PWD spec was. This was low-cost housing, 300 square feet per 400 square feet per family. By introducing courtyards, you actually make even the poorest person's house uh, a, a mansion, right, the materials we used. But even the toilets, for example, that prototype we came up with for Spark, using bamboo for the trellis, it was much cheaper than the government prototype in concrete. So the, I think elegance, costs, accessibility, they all go together. Uh, and there's no reason we should separate those. We should aspire to absolutely address those questions. So, I mean, I, 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 if, if your question is about whether they are not mutually exclusive, absolutely not. I mean, I think that's where we as a profession are lacking the imagination. So look, you know, uh, what do, uh, society invests in doctors to keep us healthy, right? Actually, society invests a lot of, in architects to help society imagine better spatial possibilities that are more elegant that we can live our lives on. I think that's the mission we have to take on much more seriously. Right, yeah. I think on that note, uh, thank you so much.